Hi there, I'm Lawrence Krauss and welcome to a special episode of the Origins Podcast, one in which I want to address something that uh, a lot of people have asked me about online on Twitter, uh, and that's the new discovery at Fermilab of an anomalous magnetic moment of the muon that might point to new physics. And so I thought uh, I would give uh, a, uh, a new... Um, uh, a, a new uh, description of that since uh, there really isn't really a good one online and since I've stopped doing Science Matters. So I prepared some things the old-fashioned way, the way I like to do it for my old five-minute physics videos. And, um, and, I, and so let's go. I want to explain the significance of this new result, how it's derived and how the experiment is done and what it all means. So uh, let's try this. So What's a magnetic moment? Well, first of all, let's talk about angular momentum. Um, uh, if a particle is going around in a circle, uh, it's hard for me to do this backwards. There we go. But anyway, if a particle is going around in a circle and, um, and, uh, and it's, the circle's radius r and the particle has a mass m and it's traveling around the circle at a velocity v, then it has an angular momentum as it goes around, which is the product of the mass times the velocity times the radius. And that's the reason that when a bicycle wheel goes around, it has an angular momentum. And that, by the way, since the, uh, since you, the angular momentum basically wants to be preserved, it's one of the reasons when you're riding a bicycle, it stays upright uh, and you can continue to ride on. That's all high school physics. Now, when a charged particle is moving around in a circle, of course, if, if a charged particle is moving, it creates a magnetic field. And when it's moving around in a circle, it creates a magnetic field that act, acts like a little magnetic dipole. A, a charged particle moving around in a circle acts like a little magnet with a north pole and a south pole. And that produces what's called a magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment for, some, for a particle that's moving around is really proportional to the current that's moving around times the area spanned by the current. Now, what's the current? The current is charge crossing any given point per unit time. So to figure if a charge is moving through a circle of radius r at velocity v, the circumference of the circle is 2 pi r, and therefore the time it takes to go, go around the circle is 2 pi r divided by the velocity. And therefore, if you want to uh, figure out the total charge per unit of time, you take the value of this charge divided by 1 over that time, and 1 over that time is now the velocity over 2 pi r. And then if you want to get the area, that's the current, if you want to get the area, that's just pi r squared. And so the product of those things is, is qvr over 2. And therefore, for a charged particle orbiting in a circle, a charged particle of mass m orbiting in a circle, it has angular momentum up here, but it also has a magnetic moment. And the ratio of those two is this. It's Q, QVR over two, QMR over 2, sorry, QVR over 2 divided by 1 over MVR. And that becomes Q over 2M. So the ratio for a charge orbiting in a, in, a, in a circle, the ratio of the magnetic moment to the, um, to the angular momentum is Q over 2M. Okay? Now, the point is that elementary particles like electrons, and in that case muons, but electrons are the first prototypical example, they have what's called a spin. Electrons spin. They have a spin in units of, of, of something called h-bar of a half. They have what's called intrinsic angular momentum. And that's what we call spin. Now that was hard to understand, but Dir Paul Dirac was, was, was the first person who wrote down an equation, a relativistic equation, describing the quantum mechanics of an electron. And, uh, and the Dirac equation describes the quantum mechanics of an electron, and it turns out that when you solve that, you find out that the magnetic moment of this spinning charged particle divided by its spin angular momentum is not q over 2m, but instead 2 times q over 2m. That was a big success of the Dirac equation because, in fact, 
it turned out that the, the, the magnetic moment of an electron can be measured, and it was roughly twice that classical value. So we can call it g times two, q over 2m, and g is 2 for a Dirac electron. But the Dirac equation alone is not exact. Electrons are not living in isolation. Electrons are interacting with radiation. And because of the laws of relativistic quantum mechanics, strange things happen. So here is what's called a Feynman diagram describing how, how we can measure the magnetic moment of an electron. An electron goes along. It experiences a magnetic field, um, in this case, a virtual photon which is described as a magnetic field, and then, it, and then it responds. Physically, what that means is if I have a spin and I put it in a magnetic field that's pointing in a different direction, that'll give a torque on that, on that spin, spin and cause the spin to precess, as I show here. It's the same, again, as a bicycle wheel. If I have a bicycle wheel and I try and twist it, you may have done, seen in physics class that it will spin around. A torque gets done, and it's the reason actually this, that, 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 that precession is the same reason when you're riding a bicycle and you want to turn the bicycle, you, you apply a torque to it and it causes your, your, the, the wheels to want to turn around sideways. So, so that, that, that's the effect that allows you to measure uh, uh, the magnetic moment of an object. You basically see when you apply a known magnetic field, how does the object precess? And the precession frequency um, in fact, is proportional to both the magnitude of the magnetic field and to the magnetic moment of the, of the particle. So that, this Feynman diagram really represents for a Dirac particle uh, the way you can measure that its spin, that its, um, that its gyromagnetic ratio, as this is called, the ratio of the magnetic moment to, to uh, the spin angular momentum, has a value of 2. Okay? Now, as I say, when, we, when measured, it turns out to be not exactly two, and we can understand why. That's because the electron is not existing on its own. It's surrounded by virtual particles. And we can understand this in Feynman diagram language as follows. So here's that Dirac picture. Sorry, I keep having to remember I'm looking backwards on this screen. This is a Dirac picture of an electron interacting with the magnetic field. And, uh, and processing, the spin processing. And that's where you get g equal 2. But in actual fact, the electron is not just interacting with the external magnetic field, but because of, of, of the property of virtual particles, this electron can basically exchange with itself a virtual photon that it emits before interacting with that external field and absorbs later. Or it can do other things. It can emit and absorb two photons. Or it can do something even wilder. It can emit, absorb a it can emit a photon, which then spontaneously turns into an electron and positron, which then disappear, turning back into a photon and then get absorbed by that electron, and a whole bunch of other things. Now it turns out each of these virtual, the more virtual particles you have involved, the smaller the effect. This was the first effect to be calculated, and it was a triumph of what was called quantum electrodynamics calculated by Julian Schwinger and, and, um, and uh, also Richard Feynman and, um, and uh, Itziro uh, Tamanaga. And they discovered that the magnitude of the effect, so this will change the gyromagnetic ratio from 2 to one, 2 times 1 plus a small number. And this first term, the small number, is alpha, the fine structure constants over 2 pi. The five structure constant turns up to be about 1 over 137. So you can see this is about a 0.1% effect, a 1 point in 1,000 effect. So the gyromagnetic ratio of an electron is 2.001, roughly. Okay? And so, but you already begin to see that this gyromagnetic ratio of the electron, or any particle, has a sensitivity to virtual particles. And that'll come back later. Now, in the standard model of particle physics, we know all of the virtual processes that can happen. We know the zeroth order process. We can know that you cannot just uh, exchange a, re a single photon, but you can exchange also another particle in the standard model called the Z particle. Or you can exchange a photon 
that breaks up into not just electrons and positrons, but into quarks. And quarks are make up particles called hadrons, which are protons. And, and, there, and there's even another diagram where the, the photo, external photon basically breaks up into virtual quarks and then turns into three photons and gets absorbed. And all of these effects can be calculated. And it turns out the effect for virtual particles, if you have heavy virtual particles in it, the magnitude of the, of the effect goes down as the mass of the one over the mass of the virtual particle. So heavier and heavier virtual particles have a smaller and smaller effect. Okay? Now, the muon is much heavier than the electron. The muon is basically just like an electron, just like a copy of the electron, but it's about 200 times heavier. Well, maybe 100 times, about 200 times heavier, sorry. And therefore, it, it, all the same physics applies, but now you can see the effects of heavy particles will be bigger for a muon because the mass of the muon here is 200 times bigger, so the effect of, vir of processes involving heavy virtual particles will be 200 times bigger, basically. And therefore, the mag gyromagnetic ratio, or g, uh, g minus 2, of the, of the muon is much more sensitive to possible new physics because, because uh, basically it's up by a factor of mass of the muon over mass of the electron, which is a factor of 200. Now the, the mass of the, uh, uh, the g minus 2 of the electron using all these Feynman diagrams and higher and higher order Feynman diagrams, literally thousands of them or tens of thousands of them have been calculated, allowing us to calculate g minus 2 of the electron to 14 decimal places, theoretically. G minus 2 of the muon has only been calculated to 10 decimal places using 10th order, you know, involving possible exchange of 10 virtual particle loops, in, in, which is just, again, thousands and thousands of, 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 of diagrams that you have to use computers to help you calculate. Why is it only known to 10 decimal places? That's because this diagram right here, the one with the virtual quarks in the center, this involves because quarks are not free particles, they have the strong. They they work under the strong interaction. They can exchange particles as they're existing, and the strong interaction is very very strong. And you can't calculate exactly this diagram because of all these possible exchanges of other virtual particles between the quarks. So there are a number of ways to calculate it. Normally, basically, you try and measure this process by measuring directly the scattering of part of of quarks in a way that can try and um, to try and measure the way they interact with photons. And so when used, one does separate experiments to try and estimate this process and then input it into this diagram. But there are uncertainties because the strong interaction physics are, is uncertain. So the dominant uncertainty in this nut calculation is due to this. It's not as big an effect for the electrons because again the electrons are, are 200 times lighter and therefore the effect of quarks and heavy quarks is much smaller for the electrons because they're suppressed by the mass of the electron over the mass of the quark. But for muons, which are 200 times heavier, that effect isn't as big and, it ha and, it, and that uncertainty therefore enters into the calculation. Okay. I want to go to the experiment now, but I'm actually going to take a break because I'm going to order some takeout food for myself and in part two of this video, I will then talk about the experiment.